from Abraham and Sarah to Jesus the Nazarene and Mary the Magdalene. Almost completely ignored in Sunday school classes is Jacob's deathbed blessing for his favorite son Joseph the Nazar at Genesis 49:26. Joseph the Nazar was the firstborn son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, whose name is derived from the Hebrew words Oric and El, which means spirit of El. Jacob's blessing for Joseph the Nazar was by the Shaddai, who will bless you with blessings of the breasts and of the womb. This image on the right is the Venus of Willendorf, one of the oldest artifacts of a goddess with breasts and womb. According to most biblical scholars and supported by substantial evidence, the Hebrew Bible was compiled and edited in Babylon between 525 and 500 BCE, which were the waning years of the Babylonian captivity. At that time, the captive Judean priests and scribes were joined in Babylon by the sage from Samos, Pythagoras, according to his second century biographer, Iamblichus. In the spirit of peaceful negotiations, and perhaps the preservation of ancient traditions, this elite group collaborated to produce the Hebrew Bible, which is a compilation of Sumerian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Canaanite, Phoenician, Judean, and Israelite traditions, both oral and written. Now consider this small misunderstanding, the Bible makes more sense. Yahweh, translated Lord, all caps, and LHM, which should be translated El of the Mother, were the names of fictional imagined deities infused with human emotions and characteristics. Now, kings and queens over many generations adopted the names Yahweh and LHM and claimed to be these fictional deities. Their subjects believed they actually were gods and goddesses. And a modern example is the North Korean's handsome, beloved, dear leader, Kim Jong-un. And then we have this, which is on the ceiling above the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. It's called the Apotheosis of Washington, and it depicts George Washington ascending to become a god. He's allegorically represented there in purple, and he's surrounded by mythological characters, primarily goddesses. Washington is draped in purple with a rainbow arch at his feet, but he's flanked by the goddess Victoria, She's the one draped in green and using a horn. And to his right is the goddess Liberty. She wears a red virgin cap, which was a symbol of emancipation. That was a Roman tradition where freed men and freed women, former slaves, were given a red cap to wear to identify them. Now back in Babylon, between 525 and 500 BCE. A new script was invented. We refer to it as Biblical Hebrew. And it was invented to be used specifically to compose the Hebrew Bible. Now the Hebrew Bible is written using only consonants. The vowels, spaces, and punctuations are added by scribes and they have more than one choice. For example, the string of consonants B R S T B R L H M, which is the opening words of Genesis 1, can be rendered Beresit Bera Elohim and translated in the beginning created gods. But it can also be rendered Bar Ish Et Abor Elohim, which would be translated Son of Man, Father Light, Ella the Mother. Now the version Jesus and Mary Magdalene used and taught is revealed at Mark 2.10, where it is written, So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth. And also at Mark 2.28, which reads, Masters are the Son of Man and the Shabbat. Now, Shabbat Hamalka was the queen, bride, and goddess of the Sabbath. She was quite popular among Jews and celebrated well into the first century. According to Arbel, in his essay called Shabbat Hamalka, 
Israeli children, even in completely non-religious surroundings, still sing songs to her every Friday afternoon, in Hebrew, Erev Shabbat, meaning the Sabbath Eve, before the queen descends from heaven to grace the world for 24 hours. So Shabbat was an ancient Hebrew goddess, well known at the time Mark was writing his gospel. Now, in this image by Rembrandt called Abraham with the three angels, I have to point out that Sarah is peeking out from inside the house. And also note the predominance of this large tree that's adorned with fruit. There are so many things in this painting that have a hidden meaning. So, now, we're going to follow the thread that ties Jesus the Nazarene and Mary the Magdalene to Abraham and Sarah through their grandson Jacob, his wife Rachel, and her firstborn son Joseph the Nazar. The first deity to be introduced in Hebrew scripture is Ella the mother at Genesis 1-1. Yahweh first appears at Genesis 2-4, but he isn't alone. Yahweh is with Ella the mother. At Genesis 4-1, Yahweh acts alone for the first time when he helps Eve conceive and she would later give birth to Cain. And this event apparently caused the breakup between Yahweh and Ella the mother because they don't appear together anymore. Abram first meets Yahweh at Genesis 12.1. Ella the mother is never mentioned until after King Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by El El Elohim, possessor of heaven and earth. The king of peace blessed Abram by El and El Most High. There was no mention of Yahweh. Abram does refer to promises he made to Yahweh, Eloah, and El Most High at Genesis 14.22. Now only Yahweh appears to Abram in a vision, and Abram refers to him as Lord, Lord, which suggests that he recognized that this was a human ruler representing Yahweh. Then Yahweh makes a covenant with Abram, and it is this, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Next comes evidence that Yahweh and Elohim were separated after Eve conceived Cain, because at Genesis 17.1 we find these words. Now they can be read in more than one way, because L can be rendered E-L unto, but this L can also be rendered Al, and that word means not or no. So Yahweh's kings would render and translate this section, Yahweh appeared unto Abram, but the Nazarenes would render and translate it, Yahweh did not appear to Abram. The second rendering, the Nazars, is actually supported by the latter part of Genesis 17.1, where we find, I am El Shaddai, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. So here at Genesis 17.1, Abram is first approached by Ella, the god with breasts, which means she was a goddess. So Ella with breasts adopted Abram. He became her son when she renamed him Abraham. And that word, broken into two words, is father of womb or father of compassion. But it can also be rendered bar ha -im, which is translated son of the mother. Now Genesis 17, 3 through 8, we find that Abram fell on his face. El the mother said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor, or the father, of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be El the mother to you and to your offspring after you. And I will be their LHM, El LHM. 
And those words can be rendered and translated Ella Ha'em El Elohim. I will be Ella the mother, El the gods. Now stop here and pay close attention. Ella the mother promised Abraham to you and to your offspring after you, I, Ella with breasts and womb, will be their gods, El and Ella the mother. Ella the mother said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Now, SRH, Sarah, can also be rendered Asherah, and this, of course, refers to Asherah, the Israelite goddess in the Old Testament. Isherah can also be rendered Isha Ora, which means woman of light, the mother of children of light. Only after changing their names does Ella the mother proclaim that this couple, renamed son of mother and woman of light, will be the ancestors or the father and mother of nations and the father and mother of kings and queens. This is Abraham and Sarah, Abraham of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, the founding fathers of Judaism. Now what's been missed, overlooked, ignored, buried, is that Sarah, or Asherah, was the founding mother of Judaism. This tradition of erroneously translating LHM as God has hidden the fact that LHM was not a male king deity. That was Yahweh. LHM was Ella the mother, also known as El Shaddai, Ella with breasts. She was a goddess queen. Two generations later, another important name change takes place when Ella the mother, Abraham's adoptive mother, approaches his grandson Jacob. Ella the mother said to him, Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Yisrael. The Hebrew word Aya means bird. S-R-L can be rendered Isha or El, woman of light. Therefore, Aya, S-R-L, can be translated bird of woman of light of El. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. At Genesis thirty-five nineteen, we find that Rachel died or receded. The Hebrew word can be rendered either died or receded and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Remember, Hebrew Orachel means spirit of Ella, and Hebrew Ephr means ashes. At Exodus 34, 10 through 14, we learn that Yahweh said to Moses, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, Yahweh, will do for you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship El and El, for Yahweh is jealous. However, this isn't the last we hear of Father El and Ella, the Light Mother. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of Yahweh. They forgot Yahweh and served Baal and Asherah. Bel and SRH, of course, can also be rendered and translated Abel and Isha Father El and Woman of Light. You see the couple called Baal and Asherah? That's the couple that was previously known as Abraham 
and his wife Sarah. However, Yahweh's kings and prophets are still around. The king of Israel said to Elijah, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? Elijah replied, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of Yahweh, and you have followed father and mother El. Now gather all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of father El and 400 prophets of Isha Ora. So the king brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is the Elohim, follow him. But if Father El is the Elohim, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Now the two opinions, Yahweh versus LHM, promoted two different versions of Hebrew scripture. Yahweh's erroneous version of Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning created gods. But it's always translated God. LHM's correctly translated version is Son of Man, Father Light, El of the Mother, the Nazarene's Holy Trinity. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of Yahweh, but Father El's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put fire under it. Then you call on the name Father El and I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the deity who answers by fire, he is Elohim. And all the people said, that's a good idea. So the prophets of Father El and Isha Or call on Father El to magically ignite their fire. But nothing happens. Apparently, magic tricks are not their forte. Now it's Elijah's turn, and he has a secret up his sleeve that requires just a bit of preparation. Just think of David Copperfield. First, Elijah builds a trench around the altar. Then water is poured on the offering and the wood. Elijah prays to Yahweh to ignite the fire that will convince the Israelites to follow Yahweh and to reject Father El and Isha Ora. Be sure to close your eyes while Elijah prays. I'm sure that's what the Israelites did. Lo and behold, suddenly the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, Yahweh, he is Elohim. Yahweh, he is Elohim. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Father El. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. The sulfur and quicklime hidden up Elijah's sleeve ignited when he tossed it on the water. This ancient trick was well known within certain circles during Elijah's time. But the naive and clueless Israelites abandoned their father king and mother queen to follow Yahweh because they believed a magic trick was a message from Yahweh. Well, today, few would be duped by this magic trick performed on Mount Carmel because we know about water combustible compounds. Unfortunately, too many are still susceptible to modern-day Elijahs who claim to have magical powers, superhuman abilities, and direct access to God. But once again, this isn't the end of the people who worshipped Father El and Mother of Light. We're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 9-11, through 11, and these are the Hebrew words and the Nazarene's rendering. The translation is, the children of Israel and children of Mother Isha Orael did things secretly that angered Yahweh. They built for themselves high places in all their towns, from Migdal of Napser to the city of Father Mother. They set for themselves pillars to Asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense on all the high places. Migdal, of course, is the Hebrew word for watchtower, and Natser means to guard or watch.
However, Yahweh has another king who's not going to stand by and watch this happen. This time it's Hezekiah. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. These battles, Yahweh versus Father El and Light Mother, persisted over many generations until, finally, to all outward appearances at least, Father El and Woman of Light were extinguished and buried once and for all. This time their graves were protected by walls built on invented stories of the evil Lucifer, the light bringer. And note that the images depicted here of Moses' bronze snake shows it wrapped around an Asherah pole. Overshadowed by these fears is the message conveyed at John 12:36, where Jesus says, Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. The parents of children of light are father and mother light. However, the invented stories that create an irrational fear of Lucifer, the light bringer, hid the story of Jesus Father Light and Mother Light for 2,000 years. But hope springs eternal even when ancient prophecies remain unfulfilled. At Micah 4, 6 through 8 we find, As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. The kingdom will come to daughter Jerusalem. Obviously, this is a prophecy that the Magdalene, the daughter Zion, daughter Jerusalem, the watchtower of the flock, would be resurrected from the ashes of Asherah that Yahweh demanded be destroyed and burned to a fine powder. Notice the lamb in this image of Madonna and Child with St. Anne by Leonardo da Vinci. This appears to be a reference to the watchtower of the flock, the Magdalene. Micah continues, Why do you now cry aloud, have you no king? Has your ruler perished, that pain seizes you like that of a woman in labor? Writhe in agony, daughter Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you must leave the city, to camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon. There you will be delivered from the hand of Yahweh, your adversary. Now remember, it was in Babylon that the Judean priests and scribes worked with Pythagoras and the Babylonians to create stories for the Hebrew Bible using strings of consonants that can be used to tell two very dissimilar stories. Now, in my opinion, that is real magic. And pay close attention to this painting by Leonardo de Pastoya, also known as Leonardo Grazia. He was a painter during the time of the Medici popes. And note the string tied to the infant's hand that's being pulled by a bird. And the Hebrew word for bird is ayah. Now, is this a boy or a girl? You can't really tell. But we do know this. The bird in this image ties this child to ayah Israel, And that can be translated Bird of Woman of Light of El. But you, Bethlehem Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. Ephrath is a Hebrew word that is generally translated as ashes, but those same letters can be rendered bat ella ha -em, daughter of Ella, the mother of ashes. This is obviously a reference to Rachel, who died or receded 
into the background, on the way to ashes, Bethlehem. So now we can read this verse as it was originally intended. But you, daughter of Ella the mother, turned to ashes. From you will come a ruler. But for now, Isha or El, woman of light, will be abandoned. And so Isha or El, woman of light, was abandoned and remained so until the arrival of the prophesied watchtower of the flock, the Magdalene and Jesus the Nazarene. Now, most scholars agree that the first gospel to be written was Mark's, and that Matthew and Luke used Mark for their gospels. Matthew used only Mark. Luke came along ten or so years later and used both Mark and Matthew for his gospel. However, most scholars have not yet acknowledged that Mark's gospel was originally composed in Biblical Hebrew, and known as the Gospel of the Nazarenes. Now, its present form is probably quite different from the original, but nevertheless, the original foundation is what we find in Mark today. We have offered this opinion to several scholars, and um, it's generally rejected, but we're not going to give up on it. We'll keep on them until they are finally convinced that this is a fact and that Mark's original gospel was written in Biblical Hebrew and was known as the Gospel of the Nazarenes. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan. As soon as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens breaking open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. As previously noted, spirit in Biblical Hebrew is orach, as in orachel, Jacob, also known as Israel's favorite wife, Joseph the Nazar's mother. The dove represents the bird of Isha or El, revealed when Jacob became Ayah Isha or El. In Mark's Gospel, the name Mary Magdalene doesn't appear until after the crucifixion. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph, and Salome. However, most scholars agree that the woman with the alabaster jar was an earlier appearance of the Magdalene. A woman came with an alabaster jar of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the jar and poured it over his head. In other words, this mysterious unnamed woman anointed Jesus using a very expensive oil. And truly I say to you, wherever the good news is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Well, this would just be awesome if only we knew her name. Oh, but let's go back to the Old Testament, to Deuteronomy 12.3. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of Ella the mother, and wipe out the name from those places. Now, the King James Version of the Bible took this admonition quite literally. Every time the name Asherah showed up, they replaced it with the word groves. The Hebrew Bible changed the name Asherah to Ashtoreth in order to hide the real name of Ella the mother, the woman of light, and her origin in Abraham's wife, Sarah. In Mark's omission of her name, while emphasizing the importance of her memory, well, that was a reference to Asherah's name being wiped from all her temples and removed from every sacred text. The name Mary in Biblical Hebrew is M-R, and E-M-O-R-A, Emora, means Mother Light. Magdalene, as we've seen, is from the Hebrew letters M-G-D-L, which is also translated watchtower. 
and this was first revealed at 1 Kings 17.9 and then again at Micah 4.6. The Magdalene is the prophesied daughter Jerusalem, redeemed from the hand of Yahweh her adversary, the adversary of all the women of light of El. James is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Jacob, and therefore the second Mary named here was the mother of Jacob and the mother of a Joseph and the rest of his brothers. She was also the mother of a daughter named Salome, in Hebrew S-L-M, which can be rendered Isha Ella M, woman Ella the mother. Okay, all the characters from the Hebrew Bible are accounted for. So, now what? They compelled a passerby, Simon Corinius, father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they crucified him. Now, if you go back and read these verses in Mark, Mark 15, 21 through 24, you can see that it isn't really clear, at least in the translations that are accurate, and not guilty of inserting the name, Mark left it unclear whether Jesus or Simon was crucified. But the last man mentioned by name is Simon, father of Rufus and Alexander. So by literary conventions, the person crucified was not Jesus, but Simon. Now, we find in the Quran this bit of information. And for claiming that they killed the Messiah Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God, in fact, they never killed him. They never crucified him. They were made to think that they did. All factions who are disputing in this matter are full of doubt concerning this issue. They possess no knowledge. They only conjecture. For certain, they never killed him. Textual and archaeological evidence suggests that historical people assumed the names Jesus and Simon in a first century Passover Passion celebration. They were members of the family of kings and queens who were descendants of Abraham and Sarah and their great-grandson Joseph. They were the beneficiaries of Joseph's triumph at the court of Pharaoh. The original title for that first century cameo that depicts the Julio-Claudian dynasty. So let's have a closer look at this cameo. Shown here floating in the heavens are the deceased members of this dynasty. Mark Anthony with the Spear of Mars, Cleopatra, and Julius Caesar on the Pegasus. The smaller figures are Emperor Augustus and his sister Octavia. The middle row depicts Emperor Tiberius holding the Spear of Mars and Julia the Elder seated. Drusus the Younger and his wife Livia, parents of twin boys, are standing to the left of Tiberius. Emperor Claudius and his wife Agrippina the Younger are to the far right. Agrippina the Elder's sister Julia the Younger is on the far left holding a future emperor. The most intriguing character is almost invisible. He is seated just below Julia the Elder's left hand and it looks like she may be pointing to him. He is one of her grandsons and I'm not sure which one but he is either Julia the Younger's illegitimate son with her lover or rapist, and his father would have been Julia the Younger's grandfather, which constituted incest. Or he could be her mysteriously disappearing son with her husband, Lucius Paulus.
Depicted on the bottom row, underground and hidden from view, are the historical fictional characters portrayed in annual festivals to celebrate Joseph's triumph at the court of the Pharaoh. These roles passed from generation to generation. The left shows Jesus and Mary Magdalene. In the center is Joseph and the Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus. And to the right is probably Salome and Joseph of Arimathea, all characters in Mark's version of the crucifixion. These are the characters that appeared in Mark's Gospel of the Nazarenes, the foundation on which Matthew built his anti-feminine, anti-goddess gospel. Matthew, also known as Paulus, separated Jesus from the Nazarene heresy by claiming he was called the Nazarene because he came from Nazareth. The author of Luke Acts drew from Mark and Matthew and attempted to repair the damage Matthew wrought. In Luke Acts, we find the following contradiction to Jesus being born in Nazareth as being the reason he was called the Nazarene. We have, in fact, found this man an agitator and a ringleader of the heresy of the Nazarene. And so what exactly was the Nazarene heresy? Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, Joseph, and Jesus, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. That's Mark 16.1, the first time Mary Magdalene is introduced by name. So what we have here are three women, Mary, M. Ora, Magdal, which is translated Mother Light Watchtower. We have another Mary, M. Ora, Mother of Light, who is the mother of James, which in Hebrew is Jacob, and Isha Ella M., Woman Ella Mother. These three are gathered here to anoint Jesus again after the crucifixion and no doubt to bless him as Jacob had blessed his son Joseph. And that blessing was this. By the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of the breasts and of the womb. Separating Jesus the Nazarene from Joseph the Nazarene in Genesis also separated Jesus from the goddess with breasts and womb. And that was why it had to be done. And that was why Matthew or Paul wrote the Gospel of Matthew to replace the Gospel of the Nazarenes. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good news of Ella the mother and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of Ella the mother is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Micah's prophecies, both of them, are fulfilled. And the secret of the kingdom of Ella the mother is finally revealed. Today, Yahweh's magic fire would be laughed at if modern-day Elijah duplicated the trick thanks to David Copperfield and a knowledge of basic science. But what about the magical resurrection of Jesus the Nazarene? The Julio-Claudian dynasty, which includes the Ptolemaic queen Cleopatra, were also quite good at magic. Osiris Serapis, who was killed and cut into pieces, walked out of a tomb year after year to the amazement of onlookers three centuries before Jesus did. And the producer of those dramas was Cleopatra's eight great-grandfather, Ptolemy I, surnamed the Savior. In Mark's version of the crucifixion, Barabbas, which means son of the father, was set free. 
Jesus was then taken inside the palace where a purple cloak was wrapped around him and a woven crown and or basket was placed on his head. Now, this private ceremony inside the palace, according to Mark, was attended by a spira, but no outsiders. The Greek word spira is translated battalion. That's an option that is supported by an insertion which says that is the praetorium. Now, this insertion was most likely added by a Paulian editor probably when the endings of Mark were added to the original Mark. And this editor even put this insertion in parentheses. The word spirit is more accurately translated a tightly held group. And this would refer to members of the Julio-Claudian royal family who are celebrated in the cameo Joseph's triumph at the court of the Pharaoh. Now we need to ask why was the cameo given this name? Well, the Nazarene's version of Genesis chapter 40 tells the story of Joseph's mother Rachel, which means spirit of Ella, who was resurrected at Pharaoh's court and called Baker. She had a dream of three baskets of bread on her head. Now, that was an enigmatic reference to the Nazarene's version of the opening words of Genesis 1-1. Son of man, father light, Ella the mother. This was the Nazarene's holy trinity. The birds in the dream represent Yahweh's priests who removed Ella the mother, which can also be rendered Lahem bread, from the basket most high, thereby removing Ella the mother from the Nazarene's holy trinity. And of course they replaced it with their own Father, Son, Holy Ghost. All of whom, of course, are men. After the private ceremony had been completed, they then put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. And with no break in the story, Mark continues, and they compelled a passerby, Simon Quirinius, to carry his cross. Then he was crucified while women looked on from afar. So you can see in Mark's version, which was the source for Matthew and Luke, Simon Quirinius carried the cross all the way to Golgotha, and Jesus never touched it. Then we learn from Mark 15, 44 and 45 that Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. And he brought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb. And he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. Now notice nowhere in this dissertation in these verses is anyone named. It's he and him, either Jesus or Simon. Mark describes robes and curtains and shrouds, any of which could be used to hide the fact that the man taken down from the cross wasn't dead, but quite alive. Like any movie or play, the actor doesn't die, it only appears that he dies. Therefore, the character the actor plays can be easily resurrected, and that's what happened. Just as the women in these images weren't really cut in half. Of course, we know that couldn't possibly happen. Surely it's only a matter of time before an ethical and honest Pope will admit to this 2,000 year old deception. The man called Jesus the Nazarene didn't die on the cross and he wasn't magically resurrected. That is the dramatized climax of a Passover Passion play performed in annual festivals created to resurrect 
is your aura L, the Nazarene goddess. There is good news, and this good news can pass the test of reason and truth. The spirit of Jesus the Nazarene and Mary the Magdalene lives on in the minds and hearts of all who follow their guidance and the example they set. And what is goodness in mind and heart if not God and Goddess in action? And this is all they really asked us to do and they left the message in stone on the east side of Rome, next to the tomb that held their bodies. In everything, then, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the essence of the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. The Hebrew word for way is darak, and that is another reference to Rachel found throughout scripture. Those same letters can create the words Ada Raquel, and that can be translated adorn the way of Ella, follow her, follow the way of love the way of life, the way of compromise, the way of the feminine. 